and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series, now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. Thanks to all of you who are subscribing and inviting your friends, family, and colleagues to do the same. My name is Scott Miller, and I serve as your host each week. I am a 25-year associate with the Franklin Covey Company and honored to be a part of this amazing podcast interview where each week we have conversations with some of the world's most renowned thought leaders on the broad topic of leadership development. Sometimes we venture into marketing, brand, parenting, things like that. Today's conversation is focused around this idea of leaders as coaches. Now, the world has no shortage of independent consultants hanging up their shingle, becoming coaches, and helping all of us in our careers, our career transitions, our moves into leadership roles. Today, I'm excited to invite three Franklin Covey associates that are the new co-authors of our book, Unlocking Potential, Seven Coaching Skills That Transform Individuals, Teams, and Organizations. Joining me today is Michael Simpson, Carrie Sadler, and Sully Sullivan to talk about how do we bring the Franklin Covey expertise, 40 years of Franklin Covey working with literally millions of leaders around the world, and what is the role that coaching plays and their daily contribution, not just to their culture, but to all those that are working for them. Today, Michael, Carrie, and Sully, welcome to On Leadership. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Scott. Sully, welcome. Hello, hello. Carrie, welcome. Hello, Scott. Our three authors are joining us from around the nation today. Michael is here in the greater Salt Lake area. I believe, Sully, you're in Nashville, or Asheville, North Carolina. And Carrie, you're from the greater Dallas area. So delighted the three of you joined us today. Now, this is a first. We've never actually had three virtual guests join us today. So we're hoping that our platform uh, manages well and that all the dogs and the kids and the distractions behind you aren't too terribly distracting. But if we have an errant dog or kid, it's okay today as well. What I'd like to do is manage the conversation this way. Michael, you are a nearly three-decade executive-level leader inside Franklin Covey. You have been an author, an executive coach, a senior consultant, one of our key thought leaders as it relates to coaching, leadership development, you were a very dear friend of Dr. Stephen R. Covey and Hiram Smith, our co-founder. And just shy of a decade ago, you were leading Franklin Covey's coaching practice prior to the acquisition of the famed leadership firm, coaching firm out of Ohio, Robert Gregory and Associates. As part of that role, when you began to help build the coaching capability inside Franklin Covey, you authored this book originally called Unlocking Potential. Recently, we have re-released this book with new insights from Sully and Carrie, experts from our coaching practice. I wonder if, uh, Michael, you would kind of rewind eight years ago and talk a bit about the original genesis of the book, why coaching became such an important need of our clients, and also would you fill in a bit of the gaps on how the four essential roles of leadership, which is Franklin Covey's, if you will, kind of main stage work session, where coaching fits into those four essential roles? Great question, Scott. Um, yeah, about 2007, 2008, uh, Sean Covey was looking at adding coaching to Franklin Covey's sort of toolbox. Uh, we had a lot of great content and we were asking the question, how do we bring about behavior change? How do we sustain results? And certainly all the research on coaching pointed to that outcome. And so I went through the uh, Columbia Executive Coaching Program for one year um, in working with a lot of our leadership clients worldwide, like TE Connectivity. We were taking a lot of our leadership content to uh, the world, literally TE Connectivity, about 3,000 leaders all over the world. And we were asking ourselves this question, how do we frame the conversation around our content to start having coaching conversations? And the the you know, unlocking potential was really kind of a predecessor, if you will, to the four essential roles of leaders. And you say, well, what are the four essential roles? The first core area is around inspiring trust. Uh, the second role is around clarifying vision and clarifying strategy. Uh, the third is around goal execution. And the fourth is around coaching and engaging our talent. So those four essential roles, really the book initially was written with the four roles in mind. And you'll see that kind of weave throughout the theme for every leader, manager to become a great coach with that sort of as the framework. Michael, the book prior to Sully and Carrie, you, Carrie joining you on its reissuance the last couple of days, I mean, this book sold nearly 100,000 copies, right? This is a large field. The, I'm guessing the, the shelves of coaching books are not few. Why do you think this particular approach has done so well 
in the initial launch of Unlocking Potential? Um, I, I would say primarily- Other than your that, masterful writing, of course, right? <laughs> yeah, aside from just terrific writing, um, you know, really you look at it, you know, people are looking for change. They wanna change their mindset, change their language, change their behavior, change their results. And I think matched with Franklin Covey's world-class content, you see this sort of need for coaches to frame the right kinds of conversations in the right way at the right time. And so it's really written, weaving in some of the world's best leadership content in a way where people can start having conversations. They can start asking the tough questions, creating a safe environment for people to think about how they're showing up where they are now and, and where they want to go on their journey for performance. And so really it was written with that intent to leverage some of Franklin Covey's content and provide just some basic coaching skills and tools for executives, for leaders, and even down with supervisors and teams. Sully, several years ago, Franklin Covey made an acquisition, which was the firm that you were a co-owner in, Robert Gregory Partners, and it was a coaching leadership development firm. You've been in the coaching business for gosh, just shy of 25 years, as you, Sully, coach executives and leaders around the world from your own esteemed leadership career, what are the biggest deficits that you see leaders facing that they're trying to address when it comes to the coaching competency of Franklin Covey's offering? All leaders want to be better coaches. They want, they are intentionally engaging with people in an effort to help them grow. That, that's their primary objective. And so, when we arrive, typically we find that they need to listen a little better. Think about it as I judge myself based on my intent, but you can only judge me based on my action. So the ability to listen for the sake of understanding and not for the sake of reloading on your argument and to be able to ask the tough questions, but be able to then engage in the dialogue as Michael talked about. Well, now I'm depressed because you're saying I should not be coached on how to reload my argument, not a great <laughs> leadership competency. I get that. Where were you in my early career, Sully? Your early career. <laughs> uh, Carrie, my sense is there probably is some trepidation, right? When uh, an up and coming rising high potential or a leader is either invited to have some coaching or it's part of the normal you know, leadership development inside an organization, what are some of the trepidations that clients feel when they are invited to coach or they're assigned to coach? And what does your team do to kind of lessen that you know, anxiety so that someone can maximize the benefit of, of uh, leadership coaching? You know, Scott, this comes up so much and it's a great question because I would say 15 years ago when people talked about coaching, it sort of had this stigma that if you were getting a coach, it was the last resort right. you know, on your walk out the door for a performance mm -hmm. problem. And in today's world, people have really embraced the idea that anybody who wants to master their craft, whether they're a speaker or a basketball player or a leader, if you really want to be the best at what you do, someone who's outside of the picture has to be giving you feedback, pointing you in the right direction and helping you see your blind spots. And so I think that one of the ways we really help leaders um, with that fear they may have initially coming into it is by setting it up as you know, a coach is a gift to somebody who's performing really well where they are, and we're just trying to take them to, you know, the solid gold status. We want them to be world class. And if you're going to be world class, um, you need sometimes that outside perspective. Michael, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to expand on some of the connections between the content in the book and Franklin Covey's four essential roles of leadership offering. Before we go there, Sully, I want to come back to you for a moment. When someone is a leader, they're in a formal people leadership role and they are improving their coaching skills. You know, they're being coached, but they are now performing better as a coach. What does that look like? What does that feel like? As you prescribe to some of today's listeners and viewers, if they are trying to improve their coaching skills as a leader, walk us through some of the, the typical skill sets that people improve post-coaching. Typically, when a leader starts down the, I want to be more coach-like path, they're gonna start to ask more questions tell less, ask more. And you need to ask with an open hand. So you can't be asking in order to direct them to the solution that you would have told them about anyway. You have to ask them openly and candidly what they think might be the right solution and then help them embrace that and move forward along their solution. People support what they create 
the science says five to one. So as a leader, you want them to have their fingerprints on the solution because they'll be that much more uh, likely to support it and to ensure that it's successful. So the more questions you ask and honestly hear the answer and then let them take forward their ideas and show their potential and their talent instead of simply rehashing some idea you may have had, that's really the first sign. Sully, I'm guessing that's counterintuitive for a lot of leaders, including leaders like myself, where we're conditioned to think, okay, so now I'm the leader. My job is to have all the answers. My job is to solve the problems. My job is to, in some cases, rush in and save the day. How do you help leaders like me, for example, realize that actually that's not my contribution. My contribution is to make sure that five to one, it's the people's idea, the team member's idea, so that they own it as opposed to me forcing it on them. Absolutely. Uh, that's that's, that's a, the big first step, right? The first step is to, is to consider that they may actually have a better solution than whatever you had in mind. And then be willing to let them explore that and learn through it and deliver through that. They improve their engagement, they improve their productivity, and often they'll outstrip the results that you had in mind by a factor of two or three. So always be looking for their solution and helping them implement their solution. By the way, it makes it a lot easier for you. You don't have to solve all the problems anymore. Now all you have to do is turn them on and let them loose. Again, where were you, Sully, 30 years ago in my career? <laughs> Reminds me of one of the many hundreds of profound things our co-author, Dr. Covey, said, you know, humble leaders are less concerned with being right and more concerned with what is right. Michael, let's have you talk about one of the big themes in the book, which is this, this concept known as strategic narrative. We teach this in the four essential roles of leadership offering. Kind of take us on a journey when a leader has the proper coaching and they're able to coach, what is the value of understanding, communicating this concept known as strategic narrative, Michael? Thanks. I, you know, the strategic narrative is a great way to get right to the C-suite when you're coaching because every organization needs to really rethink or look at their strategic direction, their formulation, their planning. And the strategic narrative is really five core key questions and a, and a dialogue and a conversation that any coach can have with these executive teams. The first one is really around getting curious and understanding their overall marketplace. What is the organizational context? And that's the, the competitors, the customer's needs, the market demands, it could be government changes. There's a whole series of questions we can get really curious with leaders around the context of what changes are coming at them. Think about the world of COVID, right? It's, it's all about how do we manage and lead in a virtual environment? Um, how do we manage change? How do we provide strategic clarity with all these disparate people? And then we kind of move secondly to getting curious and asking questions around the job to be done. It's based on a lot of the research from Dr. Clayton Christensen, but it's really around who are our customers? What are their needs? And how well are we satisfying those needs? And as we have those co honest conversations, we can really look at how leaders can get focused on serving and engaging and creating loyalty with their customers. The third key question is really around our money-making model. That's more on the business side. On the government side or education side, it's more around mission and purpose and how do we make a difference. But on the money-making model, we're really looking at why does your organization exist and how do you make money, right? That's the economic engine that fuels everything else. And so we want to get really crystal clear on how they make money and what are some if-then scenarios. Uh, the next one is really around uh, what are their core capabilities? What do they have and what do they need to develop? And having those kinds of conversations really gets leaders and organizations focused on areas where they can invest, areas of the future, or areas that they can leverage as a strategic competitive advantage. And then the last is really around um, what Jim Collins would term BHAGs. It's the big, hairy, audacious goals that would take us one to five years into the future. And those goals or strategic objectives or directives are those areas where we're going to put some some real emphasis and focus to dominate, compete, and win in the future, uh, or to significantly make a difference if we're in a not-for-profit not entity. And so those five questions are questions that we use 
in chapter seven to really get curious with executives to have some honest dialogue around really tough issues and then really drive towards clarity. Because we know, you know, as well as I do, Scott, um, all organizations have strategy. It's can they translate it from the executive suite all the way down to the, the business units and the teams that actually execute that strategy. Michael, you mentioned something, something that's interesting and that's you know how leaders coach during this virtual environment, during the pandemic. I'd like Carrie, you and Sully both to kind of comment when you're coaching clients, which you both have a large portfolio of up and coming executives and senior leaders in organizations. Carrie, you first and, then, and Sully, you can follow up. Carrie, what are some of the challenges and skills that you're helping to impart into your clients around being a better leader, being a better coach through this uh, now almost completely virtual leadership competency? You know, Scott, COVID did change the world so much and almost overnight. And, you know, from an executive coaching perspective, we used to be on site with our clients. So we did a lot of face-to-face of -face executive coaching. And now we're doing all of our coaching virtually as well, which I think really models for our clients how you can make this work. One of the most important things that, that I think a lot of people had to get over initially is when you're going to do virtual coaching, one of the most important things you can do is turn on that camera. Um, it's really much more difficult to coach someone if you can't see their facial expressions, if you can't have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, so, you know, beyond the technical skills of being able to use, you know, the camera, use Zoom or WebEx, um, you know, a lot of leaders have really just struggled with recognizing that we're in a totally different world than we were six months ago. And so to your point earlier, where there's children in the background and animals, and, um, you know, I could tell you as an executive coach that six months ago, if a kid ran through the room, I would have been mortified. And yet in today's world, it's the reality for a lot of parents who don't have another place for their kids. Yeah. So I think if I said the main skill that leaders have had to really embrace coming into this is the flexibility the flexibility to really open. If you want to unlock someone's potential, you can't judge them by the dog barking in the background or the kid running through. You really have to pay attention to what are the results they're accomplishing and then truly validate the, the heroic efforts they've had to go through to accomplish those results with what's going on around us. What would you add, Sully? I think you're right on with respect to acknowledging, acknowledging the difficulty of the circumstance and being authentic in the recognition of the difficulty it takes to deliver in these kind of circumstances, both for your team members and for yourself. Are you clear? Are you being courageous? Are you holding yourself accountable to the standards that you would have if you were all together in the office? If that's so, then that will project and your team will recognize that and it will implicitly build their trust in your leadership. If you're scattered, aren't sure about where you're trying to go, aren't clear about your mission to Michael's comment, it's really important that you get clear on those things because people will pick it up. You wanna be managing yourself through this and presenting to them what they need to see. Remember, if you're showing like your hair is on fire, they're gonna presume it's on fire for a reason. So. So back it up, manage yourself, and then intentionally connect with them. Give them grace for the difficulty of the circumstance that they're working through and that you're working through. And take the time to really understand what's working and what's not. Simply by asking that, you can learn a lot about what you can do better in the office and out. Once again, Sully, where were you 30 years ago in my career? <laughs> Sully, I'm, I'm guessing that as leaders, coaching isn't a standalone skill. Oh, it's one o'clock, I'm going to now go coach people, right? We hear more and more that coaching isn't just a leadership competency, it's kind of a paradigm, it's a, it's a mindset, it's that I am now, I am a leader, therefore I am a coach, and the coaching competencies that I learn permeate all my conversations. I'm guessing for some that's a, that's a, a, a paradigm shift, it's a belief system that needs to be adopted do you find that most leaders are now able to integrate this concept that, oh, I'm coaching in every conversation. It isn't just, oh, I'm flipping into coaching mode. What are some of the tips you might give clients, Sully, on how to make sure that you have a coaching mindset just like you have a leadership mindset? Absolutely. We do find that the most successful leaders are easily able to adopt a coaching approach and to maintain that in 97% of their conversations. And we know from the data that people want to be coached. They don't want to be told. 
They want to learn from you. They want feedback from you. They want to be acknowledged for the effort and they want to have a clear direction, but not necessarily a task, right? They want to be challenged. And so as a, as a successful leader, you want that for them as well. And so one of the tricks that we use is to have them think about a role model, somebody they've seen who does this well and act mm -hmm. like them or think about how you would want to be treated and act like that instead of having a dogmatic approach to having to be a command and control leader. I, I think you'll find that most people are, are able to adopt this different persona if they have a role model in mind. Michael, the book is titled Unlocking Potential, Seven Coaching Skills That Transform Individuals, Teams, and Organizations. Very briefly, those seven skills, and I won't go through them all in extensive detail. People can buy the book. It's easy to purchase. Um, the skills are build trust, challenge paradigms, seek strategic clarity, execute flawlessly, give effective feedback, tap into talent, and move the middle. Beyond those seven skills you teach in the book, and we teach in many of our coaching engagements, there are four principles of coaching, Michael, that you wrote about in the original book and that Sully and Carrie talk more about in the new expanded version. Michael, I'd like you to take a minute, if you would, on each of those and talk about these four principles of coaching, trust, potential, commitment, and execution. Michael, take those in order, if you will. First, talk about trust. Um, trust really is how am I showing up as a coach? Do I have credibility? I think Sully mentioned this whole idea of, are we showing up as a manager from an industrial mindset or are we truly showing up as a leader, as coach from a knowledge worker mindset? In the book lays out those two styles of building trust. Are we pulling out the baseball bat, micromanaging, controlling, uh, telling people what to do, telling people how to do it? Or are we moving more to that leader as coach that empower, that engages, that sees ourselves as equals not as someone sort of commanding or leading from the top. Um, on the potential side, uh, the International Coach Federation talks about all of us are creative, resourceful, and whole. The, the people have the capacity inside themselves. Our job is to create the conditions, right? The right space, the right boundaries of trust, confidentiality, and create a space where people have that psychological safety. And the idea is that the potential is, is, is within people. I'm not giving them potential. They already have it. And as Soli demonstrated, as well as Carrie did, we need to ask the right questions that will solicit that potential that's inside everybody. Um, when people are treated as a whole person, right, rather than as a thing, people have that, that more desire to be committed to the team, to the mission, to the purpose. And so we always say no involvement, no commitment. Um, if you want to change the world and, or your world as a leader, become a great coach. That's how you gain commitment. You solicit it from them as you're directing them towards the mission, the vision, the values, the strategy, and the goals. And then execution. At the end of the day, everything is about producing results. But the biggest part, as we know, there's there's never an underabundance of things to go after in this day-to-day -day whirlwind, right, Scott? We're, we're, we have all these competing demands. At the end of the day, the core principle with coaching is how do you narrow the focus and how do you look at the results that are important to you and your team? And that's really that execution process that we use as we coach others. And then we hold them accountable along the way. Michael, well said. You spend much of your time with Franklin Covey out at senior level engagements, whether you're facilitating, teaching, speaking on stage, or even coaching executives. Carrie, you and Sully are typically in back-to-back -back coaching calls, planning strategy sessions with clients that are implementing Franklin Covey's coaching. Carrie, I'm gonna give you the last question and answer. You know, many of our clients that are listening or watching today, many of them are members of Franklin Covey's All Access Pass, which in essence is a subscription to all of our solutions that comes with an implementation specialist that lets clients understand which solution to match which problem, which competency they're trying to grow in their firm. And many of our clients, for example, those that implement the four essential roles of leadership may choose to add coaching onto that. A good example might be you might have a, a Fortune 5000 client that chooses to train you know, four to 5,000 leaders in these leadership principles, but they might elevate a couple of hundred high potentials to some coaching. I'm guessing that's not the formula for everyone. 
Carrie, would you take a couple of minutes and just maybe inform our listeners and viewers whether they're all access pass clients or they're not? How might someone engage Franklin Covey in our coaching practice? And what are the different ways in which they can adopt and kind of get involved with our coaching um, capabilities? Absolutely, Scott. So, um, you know, a lot of what you read about when, when you read Unlocking Potential, there are so many stories of executives who have gone through, you know, really intensive six and ninth month coaching engagements with, you know, people like Michael and Sully and myself. Um, but that's not the only way that we do coaching at Franklin Covey. And so, especially for, for companies who are putting a large number of leaders through our four essential roles coaching content, what they find is, Learning in the classroom is one thing. And if you really want people to get up to speed with coaching skills quickly, reinforcement coaching can be added on to any of those programs to give leaders an opportunity to practice those coaching skills in the 12 weeks following a session to really help them hone those skills and, and to begin to develop their own coaching style. We find that organizations that use this reinforcement coaching in addition to learning the content um, get much better results over the long term. We see that behavioral change really start to happen as they go through those 12 weeks. Um, but if you're an all access pass holder, there's lots of great resources out there as well. So there's videos on empathic listening and videos on the difference of what it sounds like if you're coaching someone versus mentoring. So I would encourage you if you have the all access pass, um, you know, to, to look up some of the resources that are available. But Scott, I've heard you mention multiple times through today's session, where were we all 30 years ago for you? And I just want to pause for a moment and say, you know, we're here now. And we're <laughs> too happy late, to have my friend, them. too late. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Sully, I want to send off, and you sending us on one of two paths. Uh, like Michael um, and Carrie, you're a sage in the coaching world. You've been coaching people for decades. When someone enters a coaching engagement and they're not successful, why is that? And perhaps more excitedly, when someone is successful outside of a coaching engagement, what does that look like as well? Take us down the first, maybe less illustrative path, Sully, and end us with what it looks like when someone's successful. So there are two kinds of success. There's individual success and there's organizational success. Not all executive coaching leads to organizational success. Sometimes the best solution is for the leader to change the role or perhaps change the organization. But individually, success is moving toward their potential. And the question becomes, how can we most effectively and quickly do that within the construct of the coaching engagement so that both the coachee, the person, and the organization benefit. When things work really, really great, we've given them a platform from which to continue to have insight, continue to develop their skills as a leader, and continue to unlock their potential. Michael, you are a 30-year associate at Franklin Covey. Much of the book draws from your friendship and knowledge drawn from Stephen R. Covey. I applaud you also for inviting your colleague, Sully, and Carrie to join you on the new edition. Again, the book is Unlocking Potential, Seven Coaching Skills That Transform Individuals, Teams, and Organizations. My sense is you both are now getting back on coaching calls with your clients. Michael, thank you for joining us. Sully, thank enjoy you. the rest of your fall in Asheville. Carrie, we hope you avoid all of the uh, hurricanes that seem to be coming this season to Texas. We wish you all luck on the book launch and on your book virtual tours. Thank you for joining us. We're honored to be associated with you and Franklin Covey's firm. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here next week with another exciting guest, I assure you, on leadership.